want to just kind of give you a, a little bit about what we've done, a little bit about what we've built, but also spend the last half of the presentation really focused on uh, startup operations, which if you're already wondering what that means, you're not alone. Everybody around you, myself included, has no idea what that means. So you can read the email chain back and forth between Andrew and I in the preceding three days uh, that talks about it. You guys hear from Hyung Soo yesterday, didn't you? OK, don't compare me to him, because he's pretty damn good. So. Um, but uh, you'll hear from Sean Bonowitz, who's another close friend of ours tomorrow morning. You can throw him some, some curveballs. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. This is such a fun time for uh, companies to come in here and get to, to talk to you. If you want to know our motivation, it's a chance to give a little bit back to, to, to the people that, you know, I was very much in the same seat as you. I know Hyung Soo was very much in the same seat as you um, four or five years ago and, and would kind of soak in as much as I could. So as much as possible, I'll try to keep it useful for what you need if I start to get too far into the weeds or too high above the clouds, just let me know and I can, I can bring it back a little bit. So i like to start just sharing a little bit more about um, why I'm here. So I uh, grew up, we were just talking earlier, I, I grew up in Georgia. Um, I went to high school, college, uh, started in consulting in Georgia, which I, for those of you who've been to, to Atlanta, is anyone familiar with the Southeast at all? We've got someone back there, a couple people. Um, it's a place where entrepreneurship is often kind of a foreign term. It's a place where it's kind of what you do if nothing else works out. So take that a step further, and my lineage is Indian, um, where e even more so, at least a decade ago, that was the case, where entrepreneurship was you, you know, what you did when you didn't get another job. Um, and I think that that term has evolved over time, but that's just the culture that I grew up in. So in kind of starting this whole business, none of what we did was ever kind of a, a white space exercise. It was always just about solving a problem for myself and then solving a problem for other people that, that turned out to be the same one. Um, so I, like I said, started off in consulting. I would get, you know, a few of you probably live this lifestyle. Would go Monday morning, get on a plane, uh, get off Thursday night, you know, do this whole routine. And I, I couldn't wait to get, you know, back to the hotel Monday night after a long day at the client, change into my gym clothes and keep going. And so one of the things I would observe uh, is that the, the, the kind of dress code that I couldn't wait to put on wasn't quite like this, um, but, but inspired by this and this idea that you couldn't wait to put on your Nike dry fit running shorts. You, I, we're, most of the people in this room probably today if not everybody, does not own a pair of cotton running shorts. Uh, they've been obsolete for a decade now. You'd have to search pretty deep in Amazon to find something. Uh, and it's because Nike kind of changed that, and along with the, the help of a lot of other companies, really created the entire industry of performance clothing, right? That, that, at least in, in terms of how it's defined today. Um, but we couldn't wait to put this stuff on at night, and we couldn't wait to you know, go back down to the hotel lobby. We weren't going to the gym. We just put our Nike dry fit on and go back to the hotel lobby. Uh, I suspect some people in here wearing Patagonia, Nike, Under Armour, this idea of kind of being comfortable where you work. Um, and we were wondering, well, why, why is it that we couldn't wait to put this on? Well, it's obvious it's significantly more comfortable. You're going to sacrifice on the fashion front. You can't show up to work looking like this, but you want to wear it because it's a lot more comfortable. Um, so that's kind of the intro into the problem statement. When we looked at what the market was doing today, you'd find this guy, um, who my favorite thing to mention about this guy, not only that he obviously has massive sweat stains under his arms, but that if you Google image search sweat stains, or at least if you did like a year ago when I found this, this is the guy that comes up, who unfortunately now has a career as uh, the sweat stain guy. Um, so it, it, it just didn't make any sense to us. Why is kind of fashion playing this game that, that our fathers, grandfathers, you know, wore these exact same shirts? Um, now we started in men's and we'll soon ease into women's too, so some of my references will be more on the men's side, but evolving into both. Um, but we, we, we kept on thinking, why isn't fashion getting a hold of this? Why is fashion not addressing the fact that we are terrified to wear a blue shirt in a big presentation? Um, and the reason was because they were spending a lot of time doing this. Um, and these are some of my favorites. I had to look a little harder for these. They aren't the first ones that come up. Uh, my particular favorite is the egg dress. I don't know what was going on there, some sort of breakfast fashion show. Um, but I really appreciate it because it, it, it was kind of a, a bit hyperbolic, maybe a little bit. Um, but this idea that, that you know, fashion designers were spending so much time focused on runways, focused on how do they, you could go into a you know, dark room design. And, and it's not to say every design process is broken or every design process is wrong. But so much of the kind of, let's say, high fashion stuff was all about inspirations and, and going straight from runway to rack with a little uh, voice of the customer in between. Um, and so we came along and said, how can we change that? And so again, uh, you'll see men's were here as we evolve into offering uh, men's and women's adult levels. The, the language will change a lot, but the problem won't. The problem has always been the same. It, it's the same since I was in consulting and used to cut up Nike socks and sew them into my gold toe socks um, and did that as a personal hobby. And, and that problem statement hasn't changed. So in 2011, I came to MIT. Um, one of my first stops was the Trust Center where we met Bill. 
who as you can imagine is, is a big personality and was able to quickly connect me with uh, two other people, Kit um, and Gihan, my two co-founders. So the three of us joined up together in 2011 um, and, and really shared this exact problem statement in terms of what brought us together. Um, it was this idea of having to constantly make a compromise. Do you want to look good or do you want to feel good? And that was really it. It came down to this simple, simple statement of looking sharp or feeling sharp and the compromise that was in between. Um, so we kind of came together and we created what we now you know, call Ministry of Supply. And, and, and it was this idea of creating an entirely new category of clothing. So we call it performance professional. It was this idea of, of the two not just being jammed together like you'd find in athleisure, wearing athletic clothes in leisure situations, but it was actually a more graceful marriage of performance and function, uh, performance and fashion rather. So how could the two live together without creating this massive compromise? Um, so we, we started off, we launched the product in, on Kickstarter in 2012. Um, it's actually a very similar dress shirt to what I'm wearing right now. Um, it, was, it was based upon these simple premises. People didn't want to iron, they didn't want to dry clean, they didn't want to have to worry about sweat stains, they didn't want to have to worry about restricted motion. You know, people were often making a decision between wearing big and baggy clothes so they could move around or tight and trim clothes, but, which looked great but left you kind of stiff and unable to move. Um, but either way, at the end of the day, you couldn't wait to take it off and throw on a t-shirt and shorts and either go to the gym or keep working, uh, depending on what your career path had. Um, so in, in launching that, we, we launched it on Kickstarter. You're going to hear a little bit more about that from Gihan on Thursday. We took this kind of, uh, at the time, non-traditional approach. I think Kickstarter has become a lot more popular since 2012. Um, but we decided to go validate, did people care about this? Did people want us to be born at this idea of kind of the intersection of performance and professional. Was there anybody there? Did anybody care? Was, was anybody going to buy this stuff? Did the market actually pull what we were doing? Uh, we were very careful to say we were from engineering backgrounds, but at the same time, we're careful not to make this a technology push because that's insanely expensive and, and not very fulfilling. Um, so we launched on Kickstarter and we really came out with this, this proposed solution saying, if there's a two by two, which everybody in this room has drawn at some point about the two dimensions you're kind of focusing on, uh, and what you're bringing to the table, this was it for us. It was saying you have companies like Nike, Lululemon, Under Armour focusing purely on the performance segment. Now, as they, as they edge into fashion a little bit, they start to blur that line. You have companies like Hugo Boss, J. Crew, Ann Taylor, Anthropology focus purely on kind of where to work clothing. And they'll, of course, start to edge a little bit in our space as well. But what we want to do is build at, at, at the intersection of the two of those. Um, so our process really starts with engineering. Uh, it starts with understanding how the human body works. So how do you expel heat? odor, moisture, pressure, strain. Uh, how do you interact with the environment around you? Um, it was the biggest deviation we took from the existing design process was saying, how do we take the engineering process and apply that to fashion in a way that it had never been done before? Um, so it was taking this understanding of both quantitatively, how does a human body function? Uh, where do you expel heat? Where do you expel odor? Uh, but at the same time, talking to people, understanding what were your pain points? What did you just not really like about the existing solution? Um, so we took that body mapping, we combined it with our ability to use materials and, and manufacturing methods to, to bring the two together and, and solve this problem. Uh, now the first issue that we ran into, and I, I spend the rest of this talking a lot about the many, many issues we run into, but the first issue we ran into is that those first shirts, and I'm glad Bill isn't here because he usually piles on this point, but those shirts were ugly. Um, they, were, they killed it from a functional standpoint. You could not get a sweat stain on them, you could not get a wrinkle on them, they were in, unbelievably functional. Uh, but they looked horrible, uh, and Bill still has them. I think he keeps them in a closet somewhere because they can't be worn in public. Um, but we realized we had totally missed and said, well, you know, first and foremost, the table stakes for the stuff has to look good. People were making fashion decisions based upon how things looked, not how they felt. If it felt great, that was an added bonus, but not the decision-making unit. So for us, that was a, a huge shift. We hired a, um, you know, a high-powered fashion designer to come onto the team who had a really open mind. His name's Jarlath Mellet. He was incredible. He, he came from a background at Brooks Brothers in theory and was able to kind of say, here's the rules you need to respect, and here's the rules that you can break. Um, so over the last three or four years, the business has really evolved into, uh, again, bringing the two together in a much more graceful fashion than, than just taking performance technology and sticking it into a professional wardrobe. Uh, so at the end of the day, I, I always forget to talk about what we actually do. I often end long presentations, and people are like, are you, are you a software company? Um, we make clothing. Uh, we make, uh, first and foremost, we are a fashion company. It's taken a long time for us to even admit that. Um, we want to pride ourselves as an e-commerce company or technology company. We're a fashion company. We make clothing. Um, we take a very different and unique angle to that fashion clothing, so uh, tops, bottoms, socks, everything in between, uh, in a way that takes everything you love from Nike, Under Armour, Lululemon, and applies it to the stuff you wear to work every day. Um, so that's the simplest explanation of exactly what it is that we landed on, what we offer. Um, we're largely direct to consumer. Uh, we sell both online and offline, about two-thirds of our business is online. The other one-third is between this store here on Newbury Street, Washington, D.C., 
um, a store in San Francisco, a, another store downtown in Boston, our headquarters, and then a few more to come in the next month, actually, so keep an eye out. Um, so uh, that's all just kind of a quick background on the company. Before I jump into operations, any questions on that part? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll give you a couple answers there. One is that our R&D is actually fairly limited uh, and only to the problems we know we can solve. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's not just that we're testing out 50 different solutions to see which is the coolest technology and then finding a place to insert it. All of the technology is the aftermath of customer interviews and, and body analysis. So the idea that we've identified the problem very clearly, we've identified on paper three or four potential solutions. So for instance, odor in socks we realized that odor was a massive issue. It's kind of an obvious one, um, particularly on, on the skin. So we need skin-to-skin -skin contact with some odor neutralizing agent. So you can use sprays to do that, so actual chemical treatments. You can use silver to do that. You can use coffee. And at that point, then the R&D is actually limited to saying, we're not going to try 50 different things. We're going to try three. And that becomes a lot more feasible. Um, so we ended up landing on coffee for that one because it was the most effective. Excuse me. Um, so the second part of that is that we can actually partner with um, a lot of manufacturers. So we use Patagonia's entire supply chain. So they actually bear a lot of the fixed costs of that. We bear a lot of the variable costs of that. So the, the, the fixed cost you might think of in building out a you know, world-class sample testing facility isn't something we have to deal with right now. It's something that we can't wait to do. But at, the, at, at this point, working with our mills and manufacturers to be able to do that and say, we've bought them, let's say, an ultrasonic welder so they could figure out if there was a way to put laser perforations under the arm of a shirt and let it breathe. Um, but they'll learn how to use that and they'll amortize that cost over the lifetime of the shirt. So it actually isn't to the point where it's, you know, it's a few percent of our business. If you looked at Bill's financial statements, it's, it's significant but not a deal breaker. Good question though. Um, so I opened with this and said I think that the, the point here is to talk a little bit about startup operations. I'm going to talk about a few things but uh, really would welcome any questions and I'll save a few topics for Gion so that I don't, uh, I don't edge too far that way. But I think when, when I, I mentioned to Andrew a, a few days ago, he said, talk about operations. I said, well, what is operations? So um, I start most of my searches with Google image searches to figure out what things are. Um, and this is what comes up, which is just a bunch of, a bunch of bros giving thumbs up here. Um, and it was fairly meaningless and saying, all right, well, we, you know, we have a take. We know exactly what operations means for us. But when you all hear the word operations, it could mean so many different things. I think one of the most common conceptions of what operations means is something like this. Um, which is, again, just a, a singular definition of operations. So before I even jump into what some of our definition of operations is, have been and, and what some of our challenges have been, I'd say how we define operations, and this has been an evolving answer over time, uh, comes down to one particular phrase that's on this slide, is fixing the perceived problem of the customer. It's all about service. The right product at the right place at the right time with the right service, the right interaction, uh, the right people, the right margins. Uh, so it's all about this kind of service package. So we, we keep customer service there. Pricing is under operations. Uh, costing, obviously, under operations is supply chain. All those fit under this massive umbrella where you can really dump anything called operations. So I say that as kind of a precursor just to share that, that operations can mean a lot of things. And so when I talk here about our definition of operations, I don't want that to be uh, misconstrued as your definition of operations. And when you think about how to build that out, uh, it can mean something different to you. Um, so in, in thinking through kind of what operational challenges might be interesting to you, I picked three. Um, I, I have a, a half dozen more in the appendix if there's others that are of interest to people. Um, but I picked three, in the, in, in, and I wanted to kind of share our experience with all three of these. So the first one I picked was building our team. I think it's something that people in this room are probably going through right now and thinking about who, uh, what a great team partner looks like and what, uh, what one that might not work out so well looks like. Um, and again, I, all of these come with failures, and that's not because I picked the three that had failures. I, it, you can pretty much find a failure in any way that we've built this business. I, I think it was just our ability to kind of overcome those. Um, so in terms of building a team, I think uh, just to go back a little bit, in 2011, we started off with this tight group of, of co-founders, and we were doing everything. Um, in 2012, we found five uh, lucky or unlucky interns, depending on who you asked, that were willing to jump in and give this a shot. That's when we launched Kickstarter. There was no clue on what this going to look like, and they were incredible. So we had this all of a sudden go from a team of a few to a team of nine. Um, and that was just summer help boosting up for interns. Um, in 2013, we started hiring a little bit slowly. We had ca caught our first wind of real funding. 
started hiring people actually not so slowly, quite quickly at first. We had this money in the bank. We wanted to put it to work and, and hire up a team. Um, let's say late 2013, uh, all of a sudden the sobering reality comes to play. One, that we hired way too fast. And two, that we were hiring for role performance over working culture. Um, and so I think the lesson that we caught here is, is exactly what this equation is showing, is that from there forward, we really redefined our formula on who we wanted to work with. And, and we completely changed how we interview people, how we lead people um, down to this formula. Uh, and for us, it was a really useful one. It was this idea of working culture. That was how you work, how you interact with people around you, how you talk, how you think, how you empathize. And separating that out from role performance, so uh, how you execute on the job description that was given to you. So role performance being very inside your four walls and, and working culture being more outside. Uh, and that the two of those would lead to potential. Now, potential wasn't always what you'd achieve because there were many interferences. But at least the two of those would come together to say, how would you perform in our very specific and, and fairly unique culture? Um, so kind of thinking about the mistakes we had made. So late 2013, we had hired purely on role performance. It's a pretty common mistake I think a lot of people make. Um, and we're still constantly tempted to do. But we would hire on role performance. Um, and the reason was we were, we were interviewing for role performance. It was the only thing we knew. Uh, we would start off jumping straight into questions about your background, understanding exactly why you were qualified for this role. We jump straight into a case study, and then we make a hiring decision. Um, so what we've done since then is two things. Uh, we've, we've changed the entire hiring process. So it starts first with something out of the office, coffee, lunch, um, a, a beer. You know, wouldn't be uncommon for our first interview. And it sounds so cliche and startup-y, but it's this idea of, of getting out of the office, getting away from the role. The two people who are conducting that interview, one is the hiring manager, and the other has nothing to do with the role. So you're forced not to keep coming back to role-specific questions. Uh, then the second interview, once they've passed kind of the cultural uh, layer, is then to get into performance and saying, if we prioritize, make the first round of cuts based upon whether or not they'd fit in our environment, we might be better off. Um, the second major mistake, you know, if the first one was prioritizing performance over culture, the second major mistake we made was hires of desperation. This is something that I, I can't possibly stress enough. We'd find out that we needed a hire two months after we needed the hire. Uh, and because of that, we'd be in this frenzy where we had to go out and, and find the, the first thing we could. Uh, and it ended up with, with making a lot of compromise, making a lot of sacrifices. So we had this moment in 2013 where we looked around and said, this is a group of really bright people, but not a group of people that can kind of bring out the best in each other necessarily. Um, so it was a tough moment for us to kind of have to, to almost go back to, to, to zero and rebuild from there. So the three years after that were a, a, a long process. What were like key signs along the way? So somewhere there were probably flags flowing and there was like... Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a really good question. It's something that we've, we've only in the past maybe year or two become more comfortable talking about because it's a very emotional thing to go through when you're having to part ways with people that you've become close friends with. They've taken a risk on you. You've taken a risk on them. Um, a couple of things. One, I, I'd say is um, there were two, two that I'll come out with. One is a gut feeling in the first place. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people tend to ignore in the face of a big opportunity. Um, and two was if you'd find that role performance was mo more important than working culture, you'd hear a lot of not my job. And I think that uh, I think that's become the phrase that we all often kind of rally against now is saying that everybody on the team at some point in the last week has probably taken out the trash. Um, everybody on the team at some point in the last week has probably done something that wasn't directly in their role description, which is exactly what the working culture comes to and says, um, you know, we don't have a full-time office manager. We need to be chipping in in certain ways. Uh, there are certain times where marketing is the hot function and everybody kind of spends a couple hours on the weekend chipping in where they can there. So it's not to say that everybody's playing Swiss Army Knife generalist. It's to say that when we need that, the, the, the attitude is there. So it was a, probably the most clear differentiator when we'd see that come up. Oh, they're the worst. I'm just kidding. I think I am one. Yeah. And the potential issue, you know, marketing potential failure, hiring people right now, and it's perfect. Yeah. Do you guys do personal development training on top of the interculture? Yeah. What does the organization need? How do you help them? It's such a great point. So one of the things that I, I didn't mention when I said we changed how we interview, I also said we changed how we lead people. And the biggest thing we did there was actually split the leadership of these two into two separate people. Um, so everybody has a day-to-day -day manager, and that person is managing their role performance. They're making sure that their our job description is clear and well articulated. Um, everybody at the company also has a counselor, um, and the counselor is meeting with them for coffee. I have dinner with Zach tomorrow night. Uh, you know, it, coffee could be it could be a walk. Um, Kit and I, who's our, our third co-founder, um, we always go on a super long walk when we do our counselor check-ins once a month. Um, and those are just much more about kind of. Uh, 
underlying any frustrations, any kind of issues, any kind of uh, things that have gone well, how can we double down on those? Um, and so the counselor's much more there for really managing the working culture. Um, and so because of that, we have the counselor and, and, and me will lead one-on-ones with everybody every October, so upcoming now, to talk about what the next two and a half years looks like. So the end of this year plus 20, at this point it'd be 2017, 2018, one, the next kind of planned promotion would be, and that wouldn't be more, I mean, it could be titled, but more kind of what is the growth of your responsibility as we see the org chart grow out? What is your job evolved to? What are you aspiring to? What are you growing towards? So, and that's quite clearly spelled out by November. And that's all related to your organization's growth. Is there anything beyond that with them about their personal purpose? They're going to all be with us forever. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding, it's a really good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I will say that the retention, uh, you know, and this is either uh, the, that we've made the workplace too easy or that people are happy, and I'm, I'm hoping it's the latter. Our retention has skyrocketed since then. It was probably an average turnover of six months at that point, and we've had one person in the last three years leave. Uh, that's not an answer to your question, but that's just to say I think the shift has made a massive. Ma yeah, I think it's made a massive shift in, in how, how kind of uh, the environment we've created. It's a really good question. I don't think I've put nearly enough thought to it, um, but I probably should. Um, so it, it, it's something that we we tend to think very kind of uh, optimistically about what's happening in our four walls, knowing that um, you know a couple of people in the last few weeks have actually expressed interest in meeting uh, Bill or Rod Garcia. I don't know if you guys know Rod's the admissions director here and an incredible guy. If anybody's ever interested in coming to Sloan, you should meet him. Um, have expressed interest in, in that longer term, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, and, and I would more than happily, so I'm arranging a lunch with Rod and a few people on the team. Just one more thought, and I think working with this vendor, that what they've done is that they, when they bring the people in and they look for their long-term, they call it their scribe, yep. they actually spin out departments constantly out of that company huh. with this talent that does end up staying with them forever, and they're part owners of the company that spin off. Huh, that's interesting. I would, do you know the name of it? It's called uh, Unbridled Solutions. I have to give him a look. Yeah, they've run one company out of 10 in the last couple of years. That's super interesting. 20% of the uh, employees are owners, but the rest of them are part of the company. I have so many questions. I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, yeah, please. Yep. Yep. But then I tend to feel like maybe I'm trying to be like higher up than we want to be. Yeah. How do I compromise? Do I say that I get to know both of you or is there a more you need like one person? Right. It's a good question. I think there's a breaking point where we go from one to the other. Um, if you asked Zappos, they would very much land on the ladder and it's something that we've adopted heavily is to say we'd rather someone be deeply underqualified on role performance because if their working culture is up to par, depending on what that means for you, they'll quickly figure it out. Um, so our director of marketing today, who's an incredibly bright guy, came in as a community manager, moved into site manager, and then moved into director of marketing in, his, in that year, uh, grown a tremendous amount and had uh, you know not that much direct marketing experience beforehand. But the first goal on our list is let your guard down. And that's kind of this idea of if you are vulnerable and coachable, learning from your peers and people within the company, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. I would take a bet 10 times out of 10 on somebody who killed it on working culture and, and lacked a bit on role performance than, than the alternative. Yeah. No, it's a good question. You know, I'd, I'd say only from the experience I've had with, with two people in particular that come to mind when you, when you mentioned that, where they, where they work, work in culture, knockouts, but real performance, they had some room to grow. Both within six months of being there were significantly smarter than me at the roles they were playing. So for those first six months, probably it was me pushing them a little bit, but in, in the years since has flipped dramatically to where Orlando, who's the person I was first referring to, is one of the sharpest. He is on, he's on a Slack group with 10 other people that are in the same position at similar size companies. And uh, he is now kind of almost the point person on that Slack group and saying he's kind of the expert in the area. So I don't know if that's always the case. We might have gotten lucky a few times. But um, I would hope that if you've created that working culture that enables people to, to grow like that, uh, invested in it, let uh, people, Orlando wants to take a class at General Assembly. He's, he knows he's welcome to go do that. And can he grow that quickly? 
um, then I hopefully they outpace you pretty fast, but not a guarantee, I guess. Keep one. Um, so the second challenge we had, which I know a lot of people in this room are, are definitely having, is building that first product. Um, this was a tremendous one. So I, you know, started off with that first sock prototype that I mentioned. It was like 2009 or something like that, and um, was cutting up these socks. And I knew that other people cared about this. I knew that I wanted to make these things. I, I knew I wanted to kind of go into this world, but I had no idea who the heck makes socks. And if your only tool is Google, um, you're ending up on like some weird sites. Um, so you, you, you end up just totally frustrated. And you're like, well, I guess I can keep hand making these forever, and that'll just be, you know, it'll just be for me and my, you know, my own secret. Um, and it, it, it's, it's remarkably frustrating. It's remarkably kind of you fail 50 times. Um, we just constantly had this challenge early on, and it was something that was extraordinarily difficult to come out with. So um, we'd cold call a lot, and that wouldn't work. Um, we'd take on a lot of the burden ourselves. So when we would find good manufacturers, we would still do all the... Um, all the service. So at one point for one dress shirt, we were placing 17 different purchase orders. So the self fabric, the interfacings, main labels, uh, side labels, hang tags, um, size tags, which are separate poly bags, uh, shipping. So you'd have just this massive list of different things you had to buy. And it was just this horribly frustrating process. So um, I think our advice there, and you can see on the right, it's a, 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 a bit of a graphic there to show at the beginning, when you're building this stuff in-house, those kind of first prototypes, it's super easy. You're just thinking, I make it and I sell it. It's pretty easy. Um, you can see quickly in kind of phase two and phase three as you move from, let's say, in this case, I, I picked arbitrarily 100 and 1,000 customers, uh, that the process gets significantly more complex. And if I could do it again, I'd probably jump straight from one to four, but I guess everybody would say that. Um, we're at that point replacing one purchase order per style. We had factories that were balanced on, first and foremost, ethics. Is it somewhere that we'd want to work? Um, second, capabilities, would they buy an ultrasonic welder if we decided that was necessary? And third, service, so were they willing to buy all the buttons and hang tags and main labels and purchase it all at once? So um, we had advice from Patagonia's director of R&D who said place one purchase order per product and that was kind of final, uh, no questions asked. Um, but I think in terms of really zooming it back to where a lot of you might be in this process, uh, the only thing that I can share here is warm introductions, and that's sometimes not the easiest thing to get. It's sometimes not one degree away from you. It's sometimes three or four degrees away from you, but not one good factory did we end up with that came from a cold call. Uh, many, many frustrations, many, many bad products came from people who answered cold calls, um, but all of our best factories consistently came from us just sharing this word relentlessly with people and saying, Here's our issue. Now, we got some decent prototypes from some cold calls. Uh, even that, I would say, there's probably somebody in this room, if not a friend of somebody in this room, that can make an introduction for you to go to a high-class production facility that has strong ethics, strong capabilities, and strong service that will save you a ton of heartache of Googling and cold calling. So that'd probably be my, my single point of advice coming from that. Any questions on product? No? Everyone's got their first product made? Maybe you're not even at that challenge yet, and that's why. Um, so I'm actually going to fly through this last one because Guillaume's going to really pick up what this is. And uh, for what it's worth, we didn't know we were both presenting at boot camp until like 15 minutes before I left. I was like, I'm heading to MIT. He's like, wait, why? Um, so and we sit next to each other. Um, so I, I, I had put this slide together long before I realized that, that uh, Guillaume would be talking to you about this exact topic. Uh, unconventional routes of financing. So I'm, I'm just going to fly through it more to, to um, tease it out a little bit, and then you'll hear a lot more about this on Thursday. But um, in kind of financing that vision, I think one of the big mistakes we made, and I won't even talk about what we did. It's pretty obvious by a Kickstarter logo, a bank, and an angel, um, that we, we went after kind of a, a, a pretty mixed bag of, of funding sources. I think the mistake we made, and something that I'd encourage everyone here to do before you even get down that path, is establish what you actually need and what I say is what you need is not what you want. And I think the two are very different in the sense that in, in, in the Cambridge bubble, in this ecosystem, which is incredible in so many ways, there are certain biases, there are certain assumptions like needing funding at all um, that you'll often default into. We very much defaulted into a high funding route. We were going after money. We were going after big money. Um, we thought that was our best chance of building a billion dollar company. It turns out we were right, and I'm glad we did. At the same time, I wish we'd been a little bit more intentional about it up front. And considering the idea of, let's say, going cash flow positive from day one, having probably a much slower start, um, but, but perhaps a slightly riskier and more delayed, but same finish uh, is, is possible, right? And so 
Um, in funding, Guillen will talk to you a lot bit more about what we did. The only thing I'd start off with is just saying, make sure you pick the path that's right for you and that the default path that you probably hear a lot about in circles here and circles all around Boston and Cambridge. In the circles that you come from that are entrepreneurship centric, we tend to celebrate a lot of the wrong metrics, how much money you've raised, how many employees you have, how many square feet you have versus the right metrics, which is, are you making money? Um, I heard a really great conversation earlier about COCA and CLTV. I think those are awesome. The great equalizer of any five to one ratio, we shoot for more like a three to one ratio and would be able to build a fairly sustainable business there. Um, the equalizer to all that is, is it making money at the end of the day? And so I think that's where it doesn't matter what industry you're in at the very end of the day, what, that, that bottom line is all that matters. So that's where I think um, financing comes about and saying, do you need money to get to that point, whatever that point is for you? Um, so I'll, I'll close here before we jump into some questions with um, just a few kind of uh, reminders or things that I've probably mentioned a little bit here. But I think the very first thing in the, in the, the part of um, the, the discipline entrepreneurship journey that I tend to talk a lot about, and I'm doing so now even unprompted, is the assumptions piece. I cannot tell you how many terrible assumptions we made when we were sitting in your seat and, and relied upon um, and would find ourselves in cash frenzies because we said, well, the, if you take our CLTV assumption, you uh, well, let's assume it's a five to one. Let's divide it by five. Our Coke is going to be X, uh, and let's go with that. And and then all of a sudden you're backing into these assumptions that are just absolutely impossible to go achieve. And so uh, I think the first thing to do there is say pick those three or four assumptions that if they were wrong you're totally screwed, and really examine them and build them bottom up. What is actually feasible for your cost of customer acquisition? What are the most conservative assumptions you can make, and build around that. Uh, the second thing I'd kind of recommend is is don't act in a vacuum. Uh, there's a Sloan professor by the name of Kate Kellogg that teaches a class called Organizational Principles. And she has this um, framework that she presents called Grouping, Linking, and Aligning. Um, and it's something that we really adopt pretty heavily at our company, which is grouping is everything you do within your function, within your role, within yourself. It's very much the role performance side. Linking is what you do across functions, so how you act uh, in, in operations, how that interacts with marketing, how operations interacts with uh, sales, how inter marketing interacts with, uh, how operations interacts with product development or brand. Um, across functions and then aligning which is obviously the most important is how do you actually answer the customer's issue and how can that permeate and penetrate every part of that process not just the product development not just the marketing not just the sales but actually every ounce of your company being tied directly to that market pull um, because I cannot say enough that technology push is extraordinarily expensive and, and capital intensive if you find that market pull that's where the the gold mines are uh, and the last part is something that we wished we had done very early on and, and continue to remind others to do is in that first year or two to face the brutal facts. There are so many times where you want to listen to your gut and uh, it's easier not to. Uh, that doesn't just imply, uh, apply to team members, it also applies to factories, it applies to um, investors, it applies to any time that, that uh, your gut is telling you something or numbers are telling you something and you're just choosing to ignore it. You're doing yourself a massive disservice and so take that time to step back and say, um, is, is this, you know, what are the brutal facts and how can we just face them now instead of having them come bite us back later? Um, so that's all I have. I know that's a very generic kind of overview of how we see operations and hopefully somewhat relevant to what you're building right now, but I'd love to take some of the fastballs if you've got some good questions. Easy ones are okay too. Yeah, very scientific. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. My God, what's it? Yeah. 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 What's your background out of curiosity? Got it. But more analytical background or more kind of on the creative side? Okay, so I, I, the reason I ask is I think it, it, people often have the opposite challenge. There's some people that tend to just trust their gut way too much and not kind of want to look at what the data might be telling them otherwise. Uh, and people like me who are heavily analytical and have a really hard time trusting my gut. And so I think part of it is this is push and pull and it's just saying it's actually a balance and, and figuring out if you're someone who tends to over trust their gut to a fault, can you check that with, you know, check your biases? Um, if you're someone who tends to ignore their gut because they just want numbers to tell them a, a story and not have to trust their gut, uh, then figure out where you can actually listen to it and rely upon it. I, I don't think I have 
a cleaner line than that and saying it's probably just whatever you're doing too much of. There's somewhere in the middle that's, that's probably right where you should live. But I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I think that the the best answer I give you is just being intentional about it. Um, so we have these five values, and, and there's in a, in a separate presentation I can pull up on exactly how these five values actually exist in real life. Um, so they're not. I, I think the mistake that we made early on was that these five values weren't authentic to us. They were ones we wanted to be true, but weren't necessarily. Um, and the second thing is they didn't live anywhere but the wall, and so they were just kind of sitting there blankly on the wall. So now we've got values, and every single one of them has some day-to-day, -day, if not weekly, manifestation in real life. So an easy example is one of our favorite values is grateful but thirsty. So it's this idea that in the past you're always looking at what went well, and you're, and you're celebrating those wins. Uh, and you're taking what went wrong, and you're looking at it from a very future-looking view and saying, what can we fix? So that's the thirsty part, and saying, let's acknowledge what went wrong. Let's take that and look forward. So grateful is kind of rear-looking and thirsty is forward-looking. So that's a value that we talk about constantly. It's one of these five values. Um, we bring that to life every Monday morning. Everybody at the company starts off by doing what we call it the golden foot. It's this award we've been passing around. But by calling other people out for things that they did, and it's just this time of, of kind of Thanksgiving-style gratefulness that seems kind of cheesy, I'm sure, on day one. And you kind of get used to it once you've been there for a while. But it's probably five or ten minutes to start off every Monday morning that we spent on this, and now there's you know 20 people in that meeting. Um, it, it's a long period of time, and we kind of cherish it. So that's just one example. I, I could for the other four, and even for that one, give you others. Um, all of our feedback from the counselors on a quarterly basis is structured as grateful and thirsty. Um, our company evaluations are structured as grateful and thirsty. So all these things come back around constantly in a way that makes them come to life. Um, I think the, the biggest mistake we were making early on was just assuming that by announcing them that they would come true uh, versus saying they just they take just as much active management as your performance principles of kind of how you evaluate your job. No. Elevator pitch? Oh, that's such a good question. You know, it's it's uh it's it's gone from, you know, the 30 seconds or sorry, the, like 30 minutes down to 10 minutes. Uh, down to at this point, you know, we always talk about is we, we try to nail two things. One is what we're doing, and one is two is why we're doing. So, the what being we're making performance clothes for the workday. So, getting that down to five words so people know what the heck it is we do, because I often forget it. And then two is uh, so that we can create a new category of clothing, performance professional, um, and ultimately become the new normal in your closet. Um, and so, we try to get it down to this idea of saying, can we? capture that breadth of energy. If anybody cares about that, they'll want to know about the numbers, the target audience, all this kind of stuff. But if we can get them on, we want to build an entirely new category of clothing that doesn't exist today. They get this kind of billion dollar aspiration. And two is what the heck are we doing? We're making performance clothes for, for where to work. Um, and if we can get people on those two things, customers, investors, manufacturers, partners, it's the exact same two things. If we can get them on performance clothes for work and building a new category of clothing, um, the rest becomes a question and answer. So it's less of a kind of a full one minute pitch and more just here's quickly what we're up to. Burnout? What burnout? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I should say, by the way, um, I'm getting married next weekend. So on top of thank you. Uh, so yes, burnout is a real thing, and I think it's something that we constantly are focused on. Um, I come from a background where we were working, you know, 70, 75 hours a week, which, if you think about that, it means you know, 10 to 15 hours every workday, which wasn't out of the question. Um, it, it was intense and, and constant, and it led to a consistent turn where people would come in with all this drive, and two, maybe three years in, they'd be gone because they just couldn't handle it. So. We try to do is balance the difference between saying we, we aren't a lifestyle nine to five job, and we publish that um, every single time we make an offer. The last 15 minutes of the call, I explain to the person why they shouldn't take the offer, and, and that it is a fairly intense environment. So, trying to set those expectations right up front so that there's not this constant sense of I didn't see this coming. Um, and then part two is understanding when it is too much, and that that line comes different for different people. So, last weekend there were two people that um, quietly and kind of on the company's expense. 
we bought a, a staycation. They didn't have time or, or uh, energy to go out and take a real vacation. So we got them both a night at the West End waterfront, which was a couple hundred dollars, but totally worth in the sense of that. And then, and then a drink. If you guys have never been um, on the seaport, there's this place called Drink. Um, nobody from Boston ever goes to the seaport on a regular basis, so it becomes a good place to take a staycation for people that are here because um, it's all foreign to you. You've never been there before. Um, so we got them both a staycation. Kind of, They, they uh, came back Monday morning a little bit more energized, but it was at least, if nothing else, it didn't necessarily lift the burden that they might be going through in a particularly intense period, but at least coupled it with the grateful of, of the recognition and saying, how can we at least acknowledge that you are working hard? I think working hard and thanklessly is... is slightly worse than working too hard. So I don't have a great answer. I mean, I think that, that we'll, we'll see how that plays out, but I think kind of constantly balancing the load and understanding there will be points of intensity, but no one can keep up, you know, 70 plus hours a week for, for longer than, let's say, a few months. Um, or, or actually Orlando, who I mentioned earlier, for the last three months has just been busting it. I mean, he's probably been putting in more hours than, than you know, the next two people combined, just constantly working He's building an entire marketing function fairly from scratch because it's a new function of the company that we've kind of spun out from retail. And uh, it involved him hiring out three or four people. It involved him building kind of an infrastructure. All of that is kind of done on Monday. Um, it'll be the f completion of the first week of training. So hopefully in the next month, his workload will actually return to normal. And, and as long as we planned accordingly, saw that kind of intense period, hired accordingly, found the right resources, um, we could kind of solve that for him. So. It's not a great answer because we've, we've had the fortune of having, you know, outside money to help fund and, and be able to solve some of these problems with resources. Um, I think early on it was more just a matter of gritting our teeth to get to that point. Is that a reasonable answer? Good enough? I'll take it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you know, we started off, I think, again, um, uh, with a conflict of, from a purely maybe cultural perspective of saying who do we want to be versus kind of who we were destined or should be and kind of the deeper why. And I think because of that, our first hire was this idea of saying we are heavily engineering based. We are, uh, myself and Guillaume both come from engineering backgrounds. And we want to double down on that. So our first hire was a material science engineer, and she was incredible and great, but it turns out not at all the right fit to be our first hire. Our first hire actually needed to complement and balance us with Jarlath, our design director, who came from a high fashion background and could, could complement that in. Um, so from there, I could probably give you other examples of, of our hiring path initially being wrong in the sense that I think we prioritize what we thought we should versus what we actually kind of, again, listening to our gut, probably realized that we needed help on the fashion side. We didn't actually need more help on the engineering side and that we were two qualified engineers starting this. Um, so I, you know, I think from there it was it was a roughly a balance between design, make, and sell, and saying that um, none of those three should really outpace the others because if we over designed a product and didn't sell it, it left us nowhere. If we spent too much time on the sales side but didn't have design or, or make keep up, then there was nothing to sell. And so having to kind of constantly scale the three at the same time uh, was really a bit of a balance. So I don't think it's a hard answer on. We went all out on design for a year, all out on make for a year, and all out on sell for a year. It was fairly balanced from there on out. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, we always hire with the expectation that you would be your own, your own support operation. That more recently has changed as the company has grown. Um, but the idea that everyone's building a plan and executing it. Um, and we didn't have time for two layers of people, right? Someone who was building a plan and someone who was executing on it. Um, so early on, it was this idea that you were doing both, that our marketing function was a team of one for two years. Um, and that, that as that grew, we could kind of start to, to hire some of the support and really separate those roles out a little bit. But um, we decided instead of kind of building depth, we built breadth first to say we could have kind of a, a design makes all qualified organization and then have uh, only then started investing in, in depth, right? And saying, can we actually build on both dimensions? So I think it's just a balance of figuring out what makes sense for you. Yeah. On whether or not to take funding at all? Yeah. That's incredible. Oh, and everyone tells you go raise like crazy. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I, 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 before I even got to that question, would really start with the, the one question, like, what is it that you're trying to build? Um, if at the outset of that last company, you had said, I'm trying to build a half a million dollar company, it would have never made sense to go take on a couple hundred thousand dollars of angel money because you, you know, those guys are looking for, let's say, five, 10 X, you now owe them, you know, a, a million or two. Um, and if you're building, if your aspiration is to build a half million dollar lifestyle business, spin it off or hire a couple of employees to run it into perpetuity, make a little cash every year and go home happy, then don't take funding, which is what you did. Um, if your aspiration is to build a billion dollar business and there's some level of urgency, because if you don't do it now, somebody else will, uh, which was our situation. I think that's why I said I still would have done it the same way, but we, we, we very much want to be, you know, um, the Lululemon of our, our world. Um, and we know that if we don't, we're convinced somebody else will very quickly. In fact, since we launched on Kickstarter four years ago, several companies have started uh, since then um, that, that are in the exact same space. So for us, it's saying we got to watch out for that. We got to move pretty quickly or else we lose that number one spot the second we take our foot off the gas. So because of that, we might have needed some outside capital to speed up and de-risk our path. Um, but again, I'd say starting a, with that endpoint and figuring out what you're trying to build and then working back from there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I'll disappoint you first by saying we don't share the revenue publicly yet. At some point, I'm sure we'll be forced to or, or will. Um, we do double the company year over year, and that's something that we say with, with a lot more pride and saying that's been true since day one. That's something that, it's a pace that we've always found to be healthy. Um, one of the things even to, to before we answer how we do that that I'll, I'll share is that we constantly think of growth and health and how you balance the two. Um, so if we just went purely out of low margin growth, let's just pound the top line. Uh, let's capture the attention of, of a lot more investors who are you know, interested in that. Um, and let's ignore gross profit growth. Let's ignore cost of customer acquisition. Let's just go for sheer top line growth, which is a crop of companies five years ago would have, would have said no brainer. We've tried to constantly balance that with what's our repeat rate, what's our word of mouth, what's our gross margins. Um, and so by playing the two of those at the same time, you have to grow, you have to stay relevant, you have to stay on top of the game. Um, we've found 2x year over year to be kind of this perfect happy middle where we can still focus on kind of improving the health of the organization at the same time growing it. Um, so that's just kind of a precursor to say two feels right for us, something might feel right for you. Um, how we do that is a, a little bit less scientific. It's just this matter of saying we've got four levers that we really focus on. Um, the product itself, the customer base, how we expand the customer base, um, the channels so we just start to look B2B or if we stay direct to consumer. Um, and then the geography, so we start looking outside the U.S. So those are the four uh, levers we tend to think of and say, in 2017, we'll focus a lot more on customer and geography. Uh, in 2018, we might shift back to really building out the product line, where at this point, it's kind of one in, one out on the product. So um, those levers could change year over year, but if you looked at kind of our three-year plan, it's always pulling and pushing on those four levers. Yeah. Hey, thanks. You're just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what you're doing. Um, so we actually recently moved all of our dress shirts to 95 bucks. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm standing in the way, so probably not. Uh, was I standing in the way the whole time? No one said anything. Um, but we constantly, this is a really old slide, but it was just meant to illustrate kind of a, a Pareto of, of exactly what our price points were and where the units were moving. Here we saw an opportunity and saying we got nothing at the 48 and 60 dollar price point. Maybe we should find products to plug in there. That's just a general sense of kind of our pricing model and saying, do we kind of take advantage of all different uh, segments of pricing? I think that's, um, oh, I have a picture of Bill in here that I'll just leave up in case he comes back in. Um, so from a pricing standpoint, all of our, all of our dress shirts are 95 bucks. Uh, and I'm so happy to be able to say that because for a long time, that wasn't the answer. We'd always give a price range. Um, what we found was that by simplifying the offering and saying all of our dress shirts are $95, is that you would hopefully make a very rational decision that you were okay with that. And then you would make an emotional decision on which shirt was right for you. So we offer three different shirts. Um, what we were doing by having shirts at different price points was that you were constantly comparing the three on price and function and style and making this rational and then emotional and then rational and emotional decision that might cause some sort of overload and, and you to walk away. And so we simplified it all down and said 95 was the right price for us. We could make our gross margin targets. We could play well with the incumbents where Brooks Brothers shirts like 80 bucks or something like that. 
um, we could kind of prove value above and beyond that we'd be playing in the right conversation at, at 95 uh, and that you would then hopefully make that single easy rational decision to say that's within my willingness to pay and then you'd, you'd go from there. Um, so I, was there a second part of your question too? Uh, the belt being not oh yeah, how many times can you wear it? Yeah, uh, once is probably okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we don't necessarily uh, like go crazy on promoting a number of wares because that can uh, lead to some bad things. Um, it's 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 a lot more about kind of what you do in it. So if you could you know stretch, or if you could not go home after work to change before you head to the bar, um, if you could not worry about odor throughout a 16-hour day, if you could not worry about you're at the hotel and you want to wash it in the hotel sink and it wanted to dry quickly or in the next couple hours, could you do else? Could you machine wash it? Would you never have to dry clean it? That um, you know we have these certain dimensions that we pick on, and there are actually four that it really comes down to: uh, stretch and sweat being at the top of that, and then ease of care being right below. Um, Beyond that, we'd, we've never really prided on the, you know, um, you know like those ex officio boxers that they say like 27 countries in 34 days. Like, that's kind of gross. Um, but no, that's never really, the, the, like just pure number of wares has never been one of those dimensions. I think just because people are usually okay washing them. It's more that if, if you have to dry clean it, then you try to stretch a second wear out of it and usually end up regretting it. Yeah. Any discount with your Who, uh, Erdine came up with a good discount code. Uh, sleep is for the week. Well, I'll put it in later. I don't know what it'll be yet, but it'll be something. Sleep is for the week. I'll remember to write it down later. But don't don't try that code until like at least an hour from now, so I can go put it in. No, no, no. It's good. Yeah, constantly. Um, it early on, so I was I was starting to edge on this a little bit earlier, and I was maybe shy to actually say. More explicitly, we made many, uh, and that's not to say that the people that we hired were bad people at all. In fact, they were remarkably qualified, and still, uh, many of them are, are deeply in touch today. Um, it, it was purely a fit issue. Um, so one of the things we talk about a lot is kind of this like value, personal value arbitrage, and this idea that you can take someone who, in any system, might perform at X, but in our system, can perform perform at kind of two X because you've created a culture that elicits and pulls out the, the best of them. Now, the opposite is also true. You can take someone whose value is X in a normal organization and actually deplete their value because you haven't given them the right channels for them to, to, to let that value shine or that potential come out. Um, so that's not to say, and this isn't me being careful with my words, that's not to say that the people that we parted ways with eventually were uh, bad people or you know or half X in that kind of equation in, in the very kind of uh, cutthroat way of valuing people. But, um, it was more that our culture didn't fit how we could elicit that value or kind of pull that value out of them. So yes, many, many, uh, very early on before we established that kind of working cultural matrix and saying it was because we were, one, making hires of desperation and two, valuing performance over culture that that led to um, it probably a, a, a eight to 10. Um, and there's, there's some variation there because some of those were interns that were gonna leave anyway. Um, so it's the reason that all of them are certainly burned into my memory and I don't wanna sound flippant by saying, yep, yeah, eight to 10 but it, there's a gray area on exactly what you might call in that bucket. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so part of that, uh, it happens twice. Um, well, it happens in two different situations. So one is kind of the constant growth here. Counselor will deliver some fairly direct feedback on a quarterly basis that's structured as grateful and thirsty. So hopefully you don't leave feeling dejected, but rather energized. Uh, and then two is every year we do a one-on-one -on -one in October. And that's where we would go through a kind of a personal growth plan and see where you're kind of going from there. Wait, can I, I want to I ask one, one question. No, no, can I ask one? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, 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 in, in, in desperation for you to remember me fondly, I want to ask a trivia question. Um, I need three volunteers. One in the back, one right here, and one right here. Okay. All right, the trivia question, the prize that we're, we're, we're going to do is a uh, 100, I hope, I hope you guys don't mind me doing this, um, $198 ministry supply gift card to whoever is closest. Uh, the question is, 
how old. So Brooks Brothers, I just I don't like them. Um, I think they've they've you know they're they're super traditional. I think they're a great company. Don't get me wrong. I just don't like their, their stuff. It's not my style, and it's kind of what we want to replace as an incumbent or encourage them to come along. Um, if anyone here's affiliated with Brooks Brothers, I don't mean that in, in an insulting way. They've been around for a long time. Um, in fact, as a clue, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in a Brooks Brothers suit. Um, how old? How many years old is Brooks Brothers? Don't give any clues. I don't want any whispers out there. Yeah, when you got your answer, you can call them out. This isn't Price is Right, just closest. 180? Okay, what do you got? 200? <laughs> you can take some advice. Did you know that as you just cheat? That was such fast, insanely fast Googling. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to catch you on the technicality, not the cheating, and say that it's 198 years old, but 1818 is too many years. Um, the, the clue was in the gift card. It was a $198 gift card. Um, <laughs> for the winner right here. I'll, I'll, send, you so I'll send you something, too, as a, as a, both of you, as a, uh, a thank you for playing along. But thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed coming out here and meeting everybody, and hope you have a good week.